Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on Wednesday, June 7th here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're here to do what we ordinarily do, and that is read our daily lectionary texts and talk about it. And I have a feeling that our text today might be a little on the interesting side. So let me go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for promising through your Holy Spirit to help us to rightly interpret these texts today. And even if they might be difficult, let us remember that your word is true and that our response to it is based on your Holy Spirit giving us the faith to respond um, appropriately. So we thank you for this time and pray that you would bless it. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to start with our Psalms and today from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of their peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. In Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture text today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. If the prophets, or those who divine by dreams, appear among you and promise you omens or portents, and the omens or the portents declared by them take place, and they say, Let us follow other gods, whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you must not heed the words of those prophets or those who divine by dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. The Lord your God you shall follow, him alone you shall fear. His commandments you shall keep, his voice you shall obey, him you shall serve, and to him you shall hold fast. But those prophets, or those who divine by dreams, shall be put to death for having spoken treason against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to turn you away from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. If anyone secretly entices you, even if it is your brother, your father's son, or your mother's son, or your own son or daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your most intimate friend, saying, Let us go worship other gods, whom neither you nor your ancestors have known, any of the gods of the peoples that are around you, whether near you or far away from you, from one end of the earth to the other, you must not yield to or heed any such persons. 
Show them no pity or compassion, and do not shield them, but you shall surely kill them. Your own hand shall be first against them to execute them, and afterwards the hand of all the people. Stone them to death for trying to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel shall hear and be afraid, and never again do any such wickedness. And to Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 16. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I often boast about you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with consolation. I am overjoyed in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way disputes without and fears within. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you. As he told us of your, log of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, Though I did regret it, for I see that I grieved you with that letter, though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance, for you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourself guiltless in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who was wronged, but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God. In this we find comfort. And in addition to our own consolation, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus, because his mind has been set at rest by all of you. For if I have been somewhat boastful about you to him, I was not disgraced, but just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting to Titus has proved true as well. And his heart goes out all the more to you as he remembers the obedience of all of you and how you welcomed him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Our gospel passage today comes from Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and Jesus answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Then Jesus said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go, do not set off in pursuit. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must endure much suffering and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed all of them. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed all of them. It will be like that on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away, and likewise anyone in the field must not turn back. Remember, Lot's wife. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken and the other left. Then they asked him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, 
there the vultures will gather. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. And I didn't put a bookmark for it. <laughs> you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Well, I told you they were a little bit tough today, they didn't are I? A they bit are today. a little bit tough today. Oh, where to start? Where to start? Okay, how about this? How about we start in 2 Corinthians? Okay. And if we start in 2 Corinthians, what we will see here, uh, pretty much the whole book of 2 Corinthians is uh, Paul uh, explaining to the church kind of the difficulties of being in a pastoral relationship with people. Um, Paul as, as we uh, imagine, is a very faithful guy who wants to present Jesus Christ in the best light possible, to talk about all of the benefits of having faith in him and hope in him and all of these things. But Paul himself is experiencing a lot of the difficulties of sharing that good news with people who don't always want to hear it. We see Paul interact with pagans and share the news. A lot of them reject it. But here we see Paul talking to a church, people who claim to have faith in, in Christ. And if you are familiar with any of 1 Corinthians, we know in that letter Paul makes a lot of um, difficult pronouncements against people's poor behavior in the church. And he says, these are the people that should be driven from your midst, all that kind of stuff, because they're doing things that even the pagans would be ashamed of. They've right. taken the grace of God and they've used it as license to do uh, all sorts of wicked and abominable things. And so Paul's like, we can't have any of that in the church. The church is intended to be the body of Christ. We are supposed to be loving and serving one another, and then by extension, loving and serving the world out beyond. But even in the church, there's great complications and difficulties and angers and dissensions and all this kind of stuff. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians addresses a lot of that. And in 2 Corinthians then, he comes back and says, hey, that's tough stuff. And it's never easy to engage in um, uh, rebuking other people for their poor behavior with the goal that the community as a whole would be strengthened. Right. And so he, in this uh, chapter, is most likely talking about one of the people that he had uh, the Corinthians expel from fellowship. And now he's saying, hey, there's a time for restoration. There's a time for 
uh, judgment to be executed in an earthly capacity, uh, but then a time for uh, healing and wholeness and reconciliation and redemption. And the hope is that, um, that the people that were involved in that difficult thing will have a chance to come back together. Um, and so I think with this, he talks about the grief and he talks about the difference between godly grief and worldly grief, how worldly grief leads to death because worldly grief doesn't actually come to repentance. It's just like you people are more, you've heard of the phrase, they're sorry they got caught. They're not sorry they did what they did. They are just now experiencing the difficulties that are associated with their behavior and that causes them grief but there's no repentance. Okay. And so, uh, so Paul makes the distinction between worldly grief that leads to death and godly grief that actually does lead to salvation because it, uh, it actually is accompanied by repentance. And so it's a good indicator of when we are in uh, conflict in churches where uh, how do we determine even um, whether the conflict we have is is a good thing that's going to lead to greater growth and forgiveness and a chance for that reconciliation, or is it a bad thing where all it does is continue to tear people down? And so this is where Paul is even talking about his own temperament and his desire not to cause grief. And from a very pastoral perspective, sometimes the person in charge has to make very difficult decisions, but it's never easy to do so. And it's possible for any pastor to sometimes either be way too lenient and things just keep going uh, all haywire, and sometimes it's possible for pastors to probably be too harsh because we don't exercise judgment rightly. We are still flawed. Uh, pastors are not God um, and shouldn't be thinking of as God. Uh, but that pastoral role and that responsibility is a difficult way to navigate. And, and Paul even experiences that with the Corinthians. Um, so that's, that's my take on chapter 7 anyway. Uh, he takes great joy that the church is repentant. Um, and he also takes great joy that uh, the, the, the time of judgment has ended. Now is the time for restoration. Um, and so with that then, I think that could help us to understand some of these other passages a little better. So if we look back at the Deuteronomy passage, um, where uh, the idea of, of false prophets, even if they are able to uh, demonstrate signs and things like that, if they are leading people to worship false gods, even if they're able to, you know, in this sense, you know, predict the future or to do a wondrous sign, if they're doing anything that's contrary to the one God who delivered them out of Egypt and delivered them from slavery, we see how it's interesting how that comes up twice. Um, God's character is such that he is a deliverer. And so anybody that would want to teach about a different God or follow a different God, whether it be a prophet or whether it be people in your own family, obviously then would be one who leads back into bondage. And so there's the contrast. Do we follow the God who brings liberty or do we follow after false gods who only bring you back into bondage and ultimately lead to death? And so, so that concept of no mercy against people who want to lead back into bondage, yes. It is a harsh passage. It is harsh. But what are the stakes that are involved? Um, well, the stakes are already life and death, freedom or slavery. Um, um, and so, yeah. I think as we were reading this one, I think what is interesting about this Deuteronomy is um, when he, here in these last verses after verse six, and you know, if anyone secretly entices you, and then it goes into, even if it's your brother or your own children or the wife that you embrace or your most intimate friend, it's not, um, it was, a, it, it struck me, it was interesting. It's not like, well, the world does all of these things. There can be people close to you. And so there is this um, need for us to be, um, discerning, if you will. I mean, to be aware and 
even those that we hold closest to us um, and maybe and maybe I'm making too much but th that accountability in the Corinthians letters with Paul and this accountability for people's actions and yes there's judgment yes there's reconciliation but even here you know be aware of who is around you and even those closest to you make sure that um, they are not actually pulling you away and I think that's probably sometimes difficult for us mm -hmm. to see when those who are closest to us who we care the most about mm -hmm. um, maybe making choices or maybe asking you or enticing you to use that verbiage that's there um, be aware and be alert even to those closest you know and um, so that was just interesting because it's everyone that it speaks to it's those that are the very closest to you you know right. relationships right. that you have familial you know spousal relationship be aware Mm. So that, uh, and, and so we see that again, like you said in the Second Corinthians passage, it's you would think that your church community would be a place, um, you know, of, of family connections, those kind of right. things, and how complicated it can be and how difficult, even within the church, uh, where false prophets can come in, where uh, close relationships can be. Abused. Um, one thing that it's really important to to point out is there is a big distinction between um, this this covenant was this, these commands were given within the context of the covenant of the law, the, the Deuteronomy. Right. This is the second telling of the law. We know that um, that in the Old Testament, uh, the the penalties from an earthly community perspective. Uh, do come across very harsh. That that right. is harsh. Show no mercy. Yes. You stone them first, and then the rest of the community stones together. Yes. Um, there is a a distinction when we do come to Jesus, and the the primary distinction being, Jesus is the one who died for our sins, right. and he died once and for all. He was the one who took upon himself all of the sins of the world and paid that price on the cross. So his death then makes for Christians um, a different way of, of relating to one another. Right. Within the community of faith, as Paul would talk about, there can be a time of separation, there can be a time of excommunication even. Mm -hmm. The goal is always reconciliation, the goal is always healing and forgiveness, but the church really should not be practicing uh, capital punishment right. against false prophets. But right. the point of it, is, the point remains the same. The severity of the breaking of fellowship, the severity of the enticement back into spiritual slavery, all of these things are still very severe. The consequences, uh, because of the context of Jesus Christ, are, are very different. different. Yes. 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 Very different. Um, and so even that then, Natalie, gets back to uh, the Luke chapter 17 passage where um, the Pharisees are asking Jesus about the kingdom of God. And again, their understanding, the Pharisaical understanding that when the Messiah would come, that he would kill all of the enemies of the Jewish people, of, of which the Pharisees thought and largely practiced great amounts of righteous behavior and they felt like they were the ones that were going to be the beneficiaries of it and all of their enemies were going to be killed. And it is interesting even in that, that the Pharisees themselves um, seldom practiced uh, capital punishment. You know, granted they were under Roman administration and things, right. but even within the Jewish context, uh, they still condemned Jesus to death from Roman authorities rather than doing it themselves. We see some right. instances of of you know them picking up stones to stone for you know perceived blasphemy and things, but but the, the but then what does Jesus actually describe in uh, the the kingdom of God? The biggest thing is um, in that first paragraph when he says the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look here it is or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. 
And the whole point of that is Jesus is the very embodiment of the kingdom of God. He was right there with them. What was the sign of its coming? Him he is there. <laughs> being right there. And so again, how do we as Christians today recognize and understand that the kingdom of God already exists on this earth? In fact, we are the ones right. who are in that kingdom. We are the ones who are trying to work out uh, how how this, you know, we, we need to be good witnesses of it. How do we relate to each other better? How do we practice this kingdom of God stuff, which is very different than what the world would do? Um, and so these, these uh, semi-prophetic words, and I'm going to say semi-prophetic from 22 to 37, is some of these things have not yet been fulfilled, but many of them have. And many of them occurred during, uh, immediately after Jesus' life on earth. His coming has set up all of the necessary ingredients for the end of time. Um, and we are living in the midst of the already and the not yet. It's that tension again. All of the destruction that came upon the Jews during the destruction of the temple, so much of that's there. Here come the Romans. They're going to destroy the temple. If you go back into your house to gather your stuff, you might get caught up in it. Time to go. And at the same time, there are elements of that that have not yet been totally fulfilled. When Jesus does come again, it's going to come upon us um, suddenly, unexpectedly, just like Noah's flood, just like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. People going about their daily lives, right. doing their daily stuff, doing the normal things, and right. then doom, done. There it is. So, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Do you have anything that you want to add to that? Anything? Um, these are difficult passages. We talked they a little are. bit about it earlier. I'm glad that Natalie comes and reads with me, and <laughs> and, right. with, and, so, and and with the look on both of our faces, like and some days only reads. <laughs> <laughs> but what are we doing today? Uh, what are we doing today? Those yeah. who try to make their life secure will lose it but those who lose their life will keep it. And again, there's that huge tension within the Christian community. How do we as humans continue to live our lives totally sold out to Jesus, such that if something were to come upon us, it'd be like, okay, here, here it comes. I think sometimes people get so um, just, so complacent um, in the daily life. Um, we just get so complacent that we just, we don't see people around us. We don't see, uh, we just don't see. Our eyes are not open to even opportunities around us. And, and you know, this Jesus is living among you. You know, do we, do we look for that in the day to day? And I think that that is, as you talk about how, you know, it, it, everything was fine, and then the floods came. Everything was fine, and then you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's, it is the everyday. We live the everyday, but in that everyday, there are opportunities. And there are opportunities to, to rest in Jesus. There are opportunities to share the gospel as, you know, Paul didn't wait for the perfect time. He didn't sit back and say, well, this isn't, I'm sitting in prison. This isn't a good time. He embraced the everyday. Mm -hmm. He embraced um, the mundane and the ordinary. And I think that even in this Luke passage, it will be in the everyday, the ordinary, the mundane, nothing extraordinary. Of course, it will be extraordinary, but there's not some big, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It, there's not some big build up to that. And so I think sometimes we just get into that ordinary and that mundane and we just feel like it's just, we're just trudging along. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly, that's where we have to be. That's, I mean, it is, it is the everyday, it is the ordinary, but that's where we are. Mm -hmm. And so in that, be there and in that 
look for opportunity. I, I think they're there. And um, we think some big or shattering experience has to happen. But I think we experience God in the everyday. I think let's let's end on that because I think that's exactly right, Natalie. Yeah. God meets us in the everyday. Every day we have that choice to make. You know, are we going to seek to save our lives or do we or do we live as if you know Christ could come back at at any moment? But it's not even Christ coming back. Christ is yes. present with us. And we live in that reality. Yeah, yeah, that's Okay. That's great. Great summary there. Perfect. All right. Well, how about I close us? Yep. Thank All you. Right. Gracious Lord, thank you for your time. Uh, or thank you for us having this time with you today. Thank you for your words to us today. And, and they are sometimes difficult. And, and we don't always know what to, to make of them. And just, uh, I pray that you open our hearts that we... Um, that we can gain some understanding and that you guide us and that you help us to have these words so that we can um, live into relationship with you better. And I pray that we can look for you in the everyday and see you in the everyday and not wait for, not be waiting for some grand event or, or time, but that we, we rest with you and we see you in the everyday and that we acknowledge that you are in fact among us, that, that you're here. We don't have to wait for that. We are living with you in the here and now. And in Christ's name we pray these things, amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Well, uh, thanks for joining us today. Just wanna remind everybody, we have a singular service on Sunday. So that means Sunday school at 9.15 worship service at 1030 and then immediately following the worship service we do have a church-wide uh, fellowship lunch and everybody is invited do please call the office uh, for reservations uh, but even if you don't make any please do just come please come please come we'd love to have you there and we'll look forward to seeing you blessings to you have a great day bye-bye